now and let's yeah let's go ahead got people just coming in so yeah go ahead okay sure. all right cool hey everybody uh, my name is Ari Waller and I am the meetup event manager for JROG and uh, we're really excited uh, to join you um, Brett and team over here at uh, DevOps Utah it's always a uh, the uh, always been interesting going through the pandemic and uh, coming to different uh, meetups and just meeting a lot of a lot, a lot of new people and it's interesting. Hope, I'm not sure when the plans are to go back to face to face for you all, but uh, we're seeing it as a good transition. I actually have a face to face meetup right after this tonight, so um, it'll be interesting to see. But anyway, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with JFrog, I usually don't. Um, we are the DevOps software company founded in 2008, and most of you may know us by our uh, flagship product, Artifactly. Sometimes uh, the connection is not always made there between the company and the product. Um, we, um, many consider us to be the gold standard in managing your artifacts and dependencies. Uh, JFrog has been committed uh, to the DevOps technologies communities. Uh, we developed a free tier version of our JFrog platform uh, specifically for uh, the meetup community. And it's free to use uh, for your projects or just to play around with as long as you like. No credit cards required for it. It's not even a trial version where it automatically starts kicking in and charging you. Um, you can use it as long as you like. Um, one of the things, uh, uh, we also have uh, free hands-on workshops if people want to try that too. So I'll drop a couple links in the chat in just a couple moments to see if that's, uh, if that's something you want to look further into. Um, but with that being said, one of our core values at JFrog is community happiness. Um, that's really important to us. Um, JFrog started as an open source product in 2006, even before we were officially a company. So it's so great. Uh, um, to be able to come and uh, Jay Frog loves doing raffles and things at meetups. Now, I do have a raffle today. I'm going to share my screen. See if I can uh, easily share my screen. You think during, you think with all the experience I have with, uh, with all the online meetups, this would be really, really easy to find the share button. But you know what? Sometimes it plays some tricks on you, um, like it is at the moment. But I think we're good. Let me see here if I can. Easily share. Mm -hmm. Gee. This works. Please work. Oh, let me try it. Maybe you weren't the co host. You shouldn't have trying to can you do it. I think we're good. Ah, let's see. Yes. Okay, cool. Can everyone see my screen okay? No. Awesome. So what I'm going to do in that little predicament is I'm going to go ahead and think on my feet and I'm going to send this over to you, Brett, if you don't mind sharing this really quick. Okay. Thank you. Did you put it in the chat or? No, it's uh, for some reason, let's see here. It says it's sharing when it's not, so. Trying to get back there. Come on. No pressure. Yeah, I just to see you. Yeah, no, I know. I realized what I didn't do. So I, I logged into the Zoom room, but I didn't take the time to actually log my uh, onto the Zoom where I could share it. So that is why. And you'll see me trying to get in the waiting room. Okay, there we go. Do you need me to, I'll make you the co-host from okay, that. Cool. Uh, <laughs> turn myself on mute here. Good. So you can't hear me there. And now, am I echoing? No, but let me make you the co-host uh, so you can share. Okay, now, now you should be able to share. All right. I 
hopefully you can edit this part from the uh, video. No problem. Okay. Okay, well, all this for a little bit of fun. So last time we did something a little bit more serious. We used, an, I think we did an Amazon Alexa last time. This time we're gonna do something a little bit more fun. Um, there uh, is a, um, there is a lot of people I find in IT that enjoy Star Wars. So we're gonna give out a little bit of a Star Wars toy today. And, Officially, here we go. So uh, for, for those who are Star Wars fans, you may have already started watching the uh, book of a Boba Fett. Um, and we have a Boba Fett. Let me get the screen up better so you can see it. Yeah, it looks a little truncated. I don't see the Yeah, whole. let me see what the problem is. It's, it's on me, I think, here. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Wow. That was a. You know what? I've done this a couple hundred times, and this has been the. This has been the. This has been the, my most difficult one. So thanks for bearing with me, everybody. Um, so in this, um, it, you everyone has a chance to enter a raffle to win the a Star Wars Lego helmet set for those who are present today. Um, a winner is going to be selected within three business days after the meetup and contacted by email, so you can formally claim the prize, and uh, we can send it out to you. Uh, because compliance purposes, I'm not able to do the live drawing I would love to do over the web. Um, but that being said, it's just a way of JFrog likes to share a little bit of community happiness with everyone else. So um, what I'll do is I'll share this. I'll, I'll drop the links in the chat too, if it's easier than the QR uh, for the QR code. I have built this set before. I have about 50 different Star Wars Lego sets at home. Um, this is definitely one of my favorites. Boba Fett's obviously a pretty important character in the whole series. And I'll go ahead and drop uh, that along with the uh, uh, free software links in the chat in just a few moments. And again, thanks for having Gotham and I here in your community. And um, we really appreciate it. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Brett. Thanks, Ari. Um, yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, if you can share that, I also took a screenshot of it. So sure, I'll, I'll actually get the, I'll get that I'll get that over to you um, in just a in a couple of minutes in the direct messaging. Okay. All right. Thank well, you. Great. Yeah, we appreciate everyone attending and Jay Frog for presenting today and Gotham. Uh, Gotham's going to pr present on open source security and compliance monitoring and gatekeeping. And I, you know, as more and more of us use open source software all the time and always getting those updates on vulnerabilities, we know this is just a really key, key subject because I think some people think, oh, look, I've got this free software and everything's great and not understanding that they're actually introducing some vulnerabilities. So with Gotham, uh, with that, Gotham, let's turn the time over to you to present. And we go till, you know, about 6.50, maybe question and answers at the end, uh, or however you want to do it. If you want, if, if, if there's questions during, do you mind having questions during your presentations? And Andrea and Tiffany and I can kind of field questions as they come up. Is that okay? Yeah, uh, please feel free to put them on the chat because uh, uh, right now it is very noisy here. Uh, I know uh, uh, I might not be able to catch all of them, uh, but I will pause uh, for every uh, seven to 15 minutes to see if there are any questions in the chat and uh, answer them in that way I can be on the track uh, for the time that is allocated. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And we'll, as they come up, we'll, we'll, don't worry about reading the chats. We'll read them and then fill the questions to you. So you don't have to. Oh, okay. You know, Perfect. You know, a multitask there. So go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, first of all, uh, thank you for providing me this uh, opportunity to present uh, some of the ideas that I have and uh, the findings that I have in the field. Uh, about OSS security uh, and compliance monitoring. So uh, just a quick background. My name is uh, Gautam Nirukonda. I work as a solutions engineer at JFrog. Uh, basically, I'm a very passionate engineer and uh, uh, always wanted to learn uh, uh, the stuff around me, uh, how the technology works. And at the same time, uh, I, I did have a lot of pleasure 
in sharing my uh, knowledge with others as well. And uh, that's how I ended up in the sales uh, uh, team uh, at JFrog. And uh, again, uh, today I would like to present you with uh, some of the common patterns that uh, organizations employ in order to monitor the open source components uh, as well as their software supply chain uh, and uh, see how can how they can enforce certain gatekeeping capabilities uh, around these OSS components. So I'll keep it very basic and uh, introduce you to some of the uh, terminology aspects as well. And then uh, we'll move on to the ways in which organizations are trying to uh, protect their software supply chain. Uh, so coming to open source components, uh, as you might be aware, nowadays any organization that is uh, developing software uh, to stay competitive or to make sure that they release faster uh, to the market, they rely on 85 to 90% of open source components on top of which uh, they build uh, their business logic. And uh, more recently with the solar winds, uh, recent uh, there's a lot of emphasis on these software supply chain acts and uh, monitoring the open source components that are entering a given organization. And of course, if you look at uh, DevOps, it's all about collecting the feedback at every stage and automating the process of collecting the feedback and uh, deploying the software and developing the software that your end consumer can uh, seamlessly access. And uh, as a part of this process, uh, it's also an integral part of uh, DevOps to maintain the security aspect of it, to make sure it is safe and reliable uh, for the public to consume the software and access uh, your application that serves your business logic. So we see that a lot of uh, industry shift is also moving towards the DevSecOps, uh, which treats the security as an integral part of this process. So again, uh, as, a as a part of this, uh, talk, I want to make sure that you are empowered with some of these uh, basics and uh, you get to apply these uh, in your day-to-day -day, uh, DevOps workflows as well uh, on how to monitor these uh, OSS components. Now, uh, coming to the problem statement, the basic way in which any organization consumes an open source component is either from a public registry like GitHub or NPM Central or sorry, NPM Registry, Maven Central or J Center, Go Center, uh, there are a lot of uh, public registries, uh, Docker Hub, that serves these open source dependencies. And uh, increasingly, uh, attackers are seeing that there's a good way to collect the list of these dependencies and uh, the risks that are being introduced into these components. And uh, there are some uh, loopholes uh, in terms of how these uh, open source registries host a given package. They're also trying to leverage uh, these sort of uh, uh, basics on how uh, these public registries are serving these open source components to introduce uh, uh, a malicious code or malicious intent or uh, find out a vulnerability in an existing open source component uh, to compromise the enterprise-wide applications. So mainly when it comes to an open source component, when you look at it, these are the uh, four main uh, uh, risks that are associated with them. The first one is a security risk. Uh, it can be a vulnerability. It can be some sort of a uh, issue uh, in which, uh, like in the way in which the package has been designed that offers a backdoor for the uh, given uh, attacker uh, to compromise the system. Uh, when it comes to licensing risks, there might be a certain clause in a uh, licensing certificate associated with the open source component that doesn't allow you to uh, reuse the given component in a certain specific way. And this is something that uh, the legal compliance teams uh, are really worried about. And uh, they constantly want to generate license due diligence reports around the, uh, the OSS components that you consume. Also, uh, when it comes to these open source components, uh, the lot of emphasis is placed on the operational risk aspect of it. Uh, whether the given open source component is being constantly updated, patched, uh, whether it is using the latest set of libraries uh, or further downstream dependencies on top of which it is built. This is also uh, uh, really important and uh, going to pose a lot of risk to your organization uh, when it comes to consuming this. 
at the same time uh, the software quality emphasis all, is also really important the same way you do a lot of static analysis uh, to figure out whether the code that you have built is really robust or not uh, it goes through multiple layers of testing in order to uh, qualify it and vet it before it gets deployed into production whereas these open source dependencies uh, hosted by various public registries might not be performing the same set of uh, validation and security checks on these components. So that's the problem statement that we are looking at and how an organization can safely and securely uh, consume these open source uh, components and make sure that their software supply chain is secure. Now, one of the main solution that you can employ, uh, which we are going to talk about today, uh, it's called software composition analysis or an SCA tool. Uh, at a basic level, what a software composition analysis tool does is it basically inspects the package uh, depending on the type of packaging technology, whether it is Docker, NPM, Maven, NuGet, PyPy, each of the packaging technology has their own set of uh, standard in maintaining the list of dependencies uh, and providing that uh, as a resource uh, or a generating the SBOM out of it uh, uh, is completely different uh, in each of these packaging technology. A software composition analysis tool can solve this problem by detecting the package type and also uh, detecting the type of open source components that are present underneath it. Once this software bill of materials is available for a software composition analysis tool, it validates this list of components with a publicly known trusted vulnerability intelligence platform or a vulnerability database that constantly gets updates from security researchers across the globe on what the new set of uh, package feed uh, has uh, has been detected with any new set of vulnerabilities or new licensing issues or any operational risk. So these publicly available uh, vulnerability databases have this information. So at a base level, the software composition analysis tool is trying to list out these open source components and make sure uh, if there is any vulnerability associated uh, so let me pause here and see if there are questions. Uh, so I see there are none. Let's proceed. Uh, please feel free to uh, pause me for any questions as well as post them in the chat. I'll be happy to help you with this, uh, info, uh, like uh, uh, with providing the responses in line. Uh, now, coming to the vulnerability and threat intelligence uh, feeds, uh, there are multiple nuances here, but at a base level, I would like you to be aware of uh, the NVD database. This is a common central DB. Uh, it is an open source DB, publicly available, open to anyone to access it. Uh, it's called National Vulnerability Database. This is uh, constantly being monitored and maintained and updated by community across the globe. And uh, there's also something you might be commonly hearing about called CV and CWE. This is a designation uh, that uh, a certain vulnerability uh, will be assigned when it, when it is found in a given open source component, uh, which also has some additional details. Uh, keep in mind that not all vulnerabilities will have a CV member associated with them. There might be a recently discovered uh, vulnerability that is yet to be designated under a certain uh, CV identity as well. Uh, so why are we talking about vulnerability databases and their importance? Uh, here, the quality of an alert that is generated by an SCA tool mainly relies on the quality of the DB feed that it is integrated with. Let's take as an example, if you rely on an open source database like uh, NVD, the vulnerability might be published uh, or, or it might be aware uh, to certain group of uh, security researchers, which they first publish it in their internal DB feed uh, or their internal security team DB feed. But ultimately it goes through a lot of iterations and review process before it makes its way into the NVD database. So really, uh, the powerful vulnerability intelligence DB will give you thicker alerts and more comprehensive information about the given vulnerability uh, uh, in a holistic manner, whereas a public uh, open source DB might be slightly delayed and uh, uh, might not have uh, a comprehensive information. So it's really important to pick up a good 
SCA tool with strong uh, vulnerability DB. Now, uh, let's move, move ahead. So now we came to know how organizations are relying on open source components and how an SCI tool can help them identify the open source components and the vulnerabilities associated with them. Now, what are the approaches using which you can introduce these SCI tools into your organization? It varies uh, between multiple organizations and uh, the way in which you introduce the tool uh, also uh, mainly depends on uh, your security emphasis, where it is starting in your DevOps uh, workflow, whether it is starting in the prod and shifting left, or whether it is starting in the left at the dev environment and shifting right towards your production, right? So I have collected various uh, uh, information points uh, based on my conversations with uh, customers, prospects, and DevOps practitioners and security practitioners, uh, and uh, uh, boiled it down to uh, these three approaches that we see here. The first one is the main entry point for any dependency to enter your organization, which is the dev environment. Primarily, uh, coming to the workflow here, we'll be seeing that the developer uh, relies on certain ID environments or a local build environment. Uh, they compose the code, and uh, this code will be pulling in a lot of dependencies from the internet or from the public registries. So usually this calls will happen from the local build environment to the public registry. And once these uh, dependencies are resolved, uh, the developer performs certain quick tests uh, locally before they commit the changes into the version control system. In this case, this is very good to start monitoring and enforcing an SCA tool in the development environment because shifting left will save you a lot of uh, money and time and uh, if you imagine a situation wherein a given build or a software package is ready to be shipped to production in the next few minutes and you found out that there's a critical vulnerability uh, that is highly going to impact your organization it's really going to cost you uh, a lot uh, the, the release will be delayed uh, your customers will be impacted your business will be impacted there, will, there might be a revenue loss uh, as well but imagine a situation wherein the same vulnerability is found in the first place when the developer declared it in the first time in their local build environment it, it consumes very less time and very less effort to address it so in this case uh, these are the benefits that you're going to get as i mentioned and this is also a good visibility point as well uh, some of the sample tools that are available in the market uh, for you to uh, address or, or empower your developers with a feedback loop uh, on what sort of uh, dependencies that are that they are consuming and uh, the vulnerabilities and licensing issues associated with them is uh, some sort of ID plugins. Uh, they have certain CLI uh, based tools that can provide a quick uh, report on what sort of uh, OSS components are present. Uh, some of the tools can also integrate with the uh, source code repositories and can scan the source code uh, to list out the dependencies as well as uh, uh, create pull requests with the fixed versions of dependencies that are uh, found uh, available in the public registries and create a, a pull request so that you can quickly merge it uh, and uh, address the given security vulnerabilities. So these are some of the tools that are available. Uh, one quick advancement that you can also make in this case, uh, to better monitor the dependencies, uh, in this case, is by employing a binary repository manager like uh, JFrog Artifactory. Uh, so here, by having a binary repository manager, you are not only just uh, scanning these artifacts and providing a feedback to the developer, but every call that you are making to the public registry are now proxied through the Artifactory's remote repositories. So this is something that a unique uh, capability that uh, any binary repository manager uh, can have. Basically, they perform an on-demand proxy caching of this public registry. So now any call that the developer tries to make for a given dependency, it will be going through the given binary repository manager and the binary repository manager checks the cache in the first place. If the given dependency is not available, it will pull it from the internet. So in this way, 
the security administrators, DevSecOps engineers, or DevOps engineers can quickly examine this cache to get a quick heads up or an early warning on what sort of uh, dependencies are being consumed in the dev environment. And uh, the other advantage is you can also create security licensing and operational policies, which is a common way in which an SCA tool offers you to do automated DevSecOps gatekeeping. And uh, some of the powerful actions that you can perform at this stage is sending email notifications to the developer, to the security administrator, to the policy editor uh, that is responsible for the given policy, like an auditor. You can also block the download or consumption of a given artifact so that it stopped, like uh, the consumption is stopped and it cannot enter your organization. You can also create JIRA tickets so that uh, you can have an automated curation workflow. A security administrator will examine the dependency, see if there are any available alternatives, recommend the developer to switch to a different version. Uh, lots of ways in which uh, uh, these kind of events are triaged. Again, this is completely specific to each organization. So that's why uh, I'm not saying any specific best practice over here, but enforcing the policies and having a binary repository manager caching these dependencies will greatly help you. Uh, again, uh, a quick heads up, uh, the JFrog platform do offer Artifact as a binary repository manager and Excel as an SCA tool. Uh, this is something that uh, we also support. Okay. Now, hey, Gotham, I, I just had a question while we're there is, so does it do that in real time? So if you had, if you had like JFrog or, or a Nexus or some repository as a cache mechanism, and so let's say a developer is doing a, adding something, doing a Maven build, adds it to their Palm file, and and we use that as a a, a proxy. So it goes to to that repo first. It doesn't find any cache, so then it goes to maybe a public repo. When it brings it in, will it scan it there in real time, or will it have a catalog of vulnerabilities, or is that something after the fact that the developer would get it right then and then? somewhere later after some scans you'd be notified of hey there's a vulnerability in this new dependency you just added so it can scan in real time so of course you need to make sure that extra has that bandwidth for example the sca tool that is performing the analysis should have that bandwidth uh, and uh, ideally i would recommend having a dedicated sca tool for the dev environment because your ci cd transactions is another big behemoth that you need to be dealing with. So if you really uh, don't want to halt the developer from consuming the given dependency and still want to intercept the call in real time, uh, you have to employ the SCA tool in line and it can perform the scan in real time. So for example, in our case, we have two options, uh, block download, and at the same time, there's a sub menu called block unscanned artifacts as well so to your question uh block download can be only enforced on existing artifacts that are already scanned uh, uh, and are already available in the cache keep in mind that if a given developer pulls glitch 2.0 uh, it will be available in the cache now a separate team in a separate uh, view requests the same dependency uh, that specific Dependency is already available in the cache, which will be readily served. And the specific extra scan is already done. And uh, you can quickly leverage or reuse the, scan, the same scan result. Of course, I see that this is also something that uh, uh, prac uh, security practitioners greatly love because uh, if you just give one time exception, there's a good chance that the same dependency will appear again in CI or testing phase. and as I said, as you move towards the right, it's much more time-taking and painful process to address the given vulnerability. So I have seen a lot of practitioners uh, supporting this option as well. And this is where I would say the industry is also moving towards, okay? Okay, great, thank you. Now, let's go to the quick basics of what a security policy and licensing policy might look like so to your question like hey does it already know the vulnerability signatures or does it already know what type of action it needs to perform so 
as I, as I mentioned, the SCA tool will have uh, information from the vulnerability DB sources. And mainly when it comes to security policies that you can define, which are the rules that dictate what type of action and what type of alerting that needs to take place when a given vulnerability is detected, they use these two yardsticks to determine the criticality of it. So the first one is a standard called CVSS score V3. Uh, this is the newer standard. In this case, it will give you uh, the criticality level of a given vulnerability from one to 10. One being uh, uh, very low impact and 10 being the most uh, impactful for your organization. Same way, if you prefer to have a different sort of uh, uh, mechanism or a selection criteria to declare given policy in an SCA tool, you can go with low severity, uh, medium severity, high severity, or critical severity, right? So again, these policies can be global, which is a one policy that can be applied for all the teams, or in some cases, it can be a team specific or repo specific or uh, application specific policy as well, okay? Same way, when it comes to the licensing side of things, uh, you will have a similar uh, set of criteria. In this case, uh, basically the SEA tool will be presenting you with uh, a list of allowed licenses or list of banned, uh, disallowed licenses that you don't want to use in your organization. These two aspects are completely dictated by the legal compliance teams. Uh, generally speaking, the SEA tools uh, uh, do not have any specific recommendation here because uh, in some organizations, certain licenses are deemed to be permitted, whereas the same license clauses might not be liked by the legal compliance teams. That's why this is uh, something that uh, uh, the legal team should uh, be closely watching around and uh, uh, dictating in your organization. Same way, here we have global and team specific policies. When it comes to the automated actions, you might say that, hey, if the given component is found with a uh, RBSD license, I want to block it. If a given component is found with an Apache license, I'm good with it and it can be allowed in the organization, for, for example. So you can define these policies and uh, make sure that the SCA tool can enforce it uh, and uh, make sure that your uh, supply chain is uh, safe. Now, let's take a look at the second approach. Now, once the given uh, dependency or sorry once the local build is successful the developer might push the changes into the version control system now you have your ci tool or an automation build tool that gets triggered nightly hourly uh, or based on a commit uh, webhook uh, it will utilize the internal build tools specific to the ci tool and uh, it tries to pull these dependencies from the remote repositories in these cases you can employ a command line based uh, SEA analysis as a part of your pipeline and uh, uh, get the scan results uh, within the scan pipeline itself. And uh, this is something that uh, is also gaining a lot of traction with the Biden mandate, uh, Joe Biden's uh, executive cybersecurity order last year. Uh, it requires all the organizations working with federal government to produce a software bill of materials which is like a list of all the software constituents with which the given software package has been built. And uh, this will make sure that the software consumer uh, utilizing the software is well aware of the constituents and that they can also leverage some sort of an automation tool in the downstream to know about the vulnerability, licensing and operational risks associated with the given software package that has been delivered. And we see that this will have a ripple effect on the entire DevOps industry as well, uh, no matter which vertical you are in, uh, FinTech, uh, healthcare, uh, automotive industries, uh, whatnot. Everyone will start in, uh, implementing this uh, SBOM uh, publication method. And here in this case, one more uh, good approach would be integrating your binary repository manager with your CI tool. Uh, there are so many benefits associated with them. The first one being the remote repository cache is already populated with all the dependencies that you have used in the step one during the development phase or in the first approach in the development phase. Having the CI tool 
resolve the dependencies from a binary repository manager can also uh, make sure that there are faster and uh, stable builds because even if the public registry is down or the dependency that you're relying on is removed from the public registry, you're still continuing your development activity. And now one of the security best practice that I would recommend in this, in this case is you can have a policy for your dev cache or your dev environment. And after you closely monitor and enforce a policy on these set of cached dependencies, you can also make sure that there's a whitelisted or approved set of artifact dependencies that your organization can consume. So now your CI tool should only point to the whitelisted libraries or curated libraries so that starting from here, this is the main entry point in like of these software components or OSS components, they can make their way into your organization, into your proprietary software. So this is the first and uh, good place uh, to enforce that uh, uh, whitelisting and uh, curate the dependencies that you are consuming. Same way, uh, you can have more lenient policy on the dev environment because uh, uh, you don't, you might not want to block every developer from consuming certain dependency. And at the same time, between the time that they first perform the local build to the time that they publish the version control changes, they have to make sure that the given dependency is now part of the whitelisted uh, entry, either by complying with the policies, which will automatically qualify the given dependency to make its way into the whitelisted repo, or by requesting a temporary exception from the security admin that this dependency has no alternative or uh, this is the best possible uh, version that is available out there, for example. So there can be multiple conditions which will require a manual approval, okay? So this is how you're also securing uh, the set of dependencies your CI tool can consume and also making sure that it is faster and more reliable. And one another advantage here is that some of the uh, uh, CI tools as well as binary repository managers will give you an option to enhance the SBOM by collecting the system environment variables or tool set that you have used to create the given build because the same source code might not produce the same artifact if you build it again due to varying build conditions or due to varying transitive dependencies. So you should always enhance the SBOM by working with the CI tool as well as the binary rep repository manager uh, to make sure even the transitive dependencies are collected during this process. For example, in case of JFrog platform, we give you a CLI tool to collect this information, but I've seen that a lot of other CI tools as well uh, have some kind of an integration or a plugin uh, that can uh, perform this uh, enhancement. So hey, these are- hey, yeah. Gotham. Um, yeah, can I jump in? Sorry, I was yeah, waiting for go you. Ahead. There. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I have kind of a question here. We, we talk about throwing this into the CI build. That's great. In my experience working with like GitHub and stuff, a lot of the CVs that are issued for dependencies like are not particularly relevant. Is there a good way, is there a good tool? Maybe JFrog does this, maybe like the OSWAP SBOM tool does it to debounce those. And that's the first question, right? Like how do, how do we manage these number of requests from when most of them are entirely frivolous? And secondly, what kind of process do you recommend? In your example there, you highlighted asking the security officer for an exception, but that seems kind of weird because the, the security officer is usually like an IT guy who doesn't necessarily know like the code or the project and whether you're, you're even using the method that is a part of the CVE, right? Yeah, so to your first question, uh, yes, that's the biggest challenge that the industry is facing. Uh, a lot of uh, SCI alerts that are coming out of a tool might not be relevant for your organization. And uh, this is where uh, a lot of uh, uh, vendors out there are trying to deliver something called contextual analysis by going one level deeper into uh, the binary or utilizing some sort of source code available for it in certain, certain packaging technologies to find out whether the vulnerable function within the uh, library, impacted library is being invoked or not. That's one way 
to you know uh, decouple uh, those irrelevant alerts and only address the ones that are most relevant for your organization i've also seen in some cases uh, this context can be coming in from the uh, packaging layer that is encompassing the uh, application for example uh, your docker container might not be exposing the service port associated with the vulnerable library so in that case you are not going to be impacted by the given cve so this is something that uh, some intelligent or smart sca tools are aiming towards to uh, aiming uh, to implement in the solution so that you can reduce the noise of alerts coming out of your sca tool uh, to your second question uh, yes it's not a common scenario where an it administrator will be uh, uh, having that kind of a due diligence to uh, certify or allow a temporary exception. As I mentioned, these are some of the scenarios that I've seen. Of course, uh, the specific example that I'm talking about here has a dedicated security team or analysts who constantly uh, stay in touch with the development team. And they're at a stage wherein they want to do this enforcement at a very strict uh, way. And uh, the developer is also aware of the workflow that they need to go through or the burden that they need to go through to get an exception, right? In a, in a way, it is making it hard for the developer to consume a given dependency, but at the same point, some sort of events might have triggered the organization to take this strict approach. They might be impacted with a recent uh, uh, OSS component that has caused uh, them a lot of reputation loss or revenue loss or, uh, you know, as a part of the vendors that they're working with or customers that they're working with, they have to make sure that everything is safe and secure. So I see that that is a approach. But again, as I'm mentioning, each of these best practice, you should always take a phased approach to onboard it. Uh, the first step would be getting the visibility. At least you know what is coming in from the internet, right? Uh, rather than allowing the developer to consume anything from anywhere, right? Now you know what sources they're relying on, what dependencies they're relying on, right? That's a good first step. Second step is to go with a lenient policy saying that, hey, I'll send you an email alert, uh, try to address them, at least try to address the critical severity issues. And then in the phase two, you give them a mandate saying that security is something that is picking up a lot of uh, importance and there's an ordinance from CISO. For example, I'm just talking about some of the scenarios that can happen for an organization to move to the full restrictive approach, right? Do you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go with the, the third approach. Now, as you might be aware, the entire uh, uh, DevSecOps or DevOps implementation contains multiple stages. And at each stage, uh, the given software package or application goes through certain set of tests or vetting or qualification uh, that makes it eligible to move to the next stage in the DevOps life cycle. And uh, DevOps is all about feedback as we talked about. And at the same way, security cannot be a, or, or a software composition analysis scan cannot be a snapshot one-time scan uh, that allows a given component to be utilized in your organization. We have seen just now on, on how to secure the dev environment and how to secure the CI environment. But you need to make sure that there's a uh, security check or license compliance and vulnerability checks being performed in all the other stages as well, in the test, release, deploy, and operate stages as well. Because today, you might look at Log4j library. Uh, the recent uh, discovery of uh, vulnerability in the Log4j, all the organizations that are impacted by it are not the ones that have consumed it after the vulnerability has been discovered. It was supposed to be secure or assumed to be secure two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, and uh, people started consuming it. And this is when 
uh, one of the at, at some point in the software supply chain, one of the contributor by by mistake directly or indirectly has imposed a, uh, a vulnerability in it, and uh, it started ringing the chaos bells everywhere and uh, bringing down every organization to come back and look into the security practices that they have in the organization. So today you might certify a given library or artifact to be qualified to be utilized in the dev environment and the CI environment, but there's no guarantee that down the lane, by the time it is getting released or running in the production, it might not stay secure the same way. So you should enforce uh, these SCS scans all across the DevOps lifecycle stages and uh, something that I highly recommend uh, to the organizations. And at the same time, uh, as you move towards the right in the SDLC lifecycle stages, you need to make sure that you control the alerts and uh, address the ones that are most relevant for your organization. For example, a critical level severity found in fraud is going to have highest impact whereas a critical level severity found in the dev environment is not going to really impact your organization because maybe it might not make its way all the way through and ultimately uh, get into the production. So as you move towards the right, the number of binaries or the software artifacts will decrease, but at the same time, uh, the criticality level of them will increase. So uh, at each stage, you need to make sure that there's a lenient to stringent policies applied. And at the same time, uh, uh, you need to carefully manage the violations and the noise of alerts that you're going to get. So I'm, I will move to the conclusion slide. I see that we are on the top of the R. So today we have learned about how security can be an uh, integral part of the DevOps implementation and some of the approaches that organizations can take to monitor the OSS components entering the organization. And we have learned some basics uh, of what an SCI tool is, what a vulnerability intelligence DB is, some of the terminology associated with it, and the security and licensing policies, how they look, and uh, what are the best practices in implementing these tools uh, in your organization. Thank you. So uh, I will switch to the chat to see if you if you have any questions and uh, Brett let me know if you want me to take these questions offline or can we spend a few minutes answering the questions on the chat no we've got we've got if there's some if people have questions we've got some time um appreciate the presentation I did put for that NVD and CVE URLs are those the correct URLs you're talking about for those databases for those vulnerabilities yes. That's okay. Right. So I would also love to hear your the presentation and the, uh, what are the techniques or tools that you're trying to implement in your organization. I would love to chat about it. Uh, let me just go over the questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is how do you recommend that engineers consume these databases? So generally speaking, uh, these databases are publicly available and you can uh, search quickly on a given dependency and see if there's any matching string or matching CV associated with your dependency. Uh, some of them are open databases. Some of them are private databases. NVD is open to public. Uh, some of the uh, databases are don't offer the browsing capabilities. For example, although the best way in which the developers can consume this database is through an SCA tool or through these IDE plugins, which can do the heavy lifting of uh, fetching the list of packages that they have declared in their project and comparing it with the database and producing the results within the IDE itself or within their command line itself so that they can quickly work on the feedback. Uh, these databases and the browsing capabilities that they offer are mainly focused towards security analysts and the security engineers who are more interested into digging deep uh, into this vulnerability and remediation techniques. Okay. Uh, for instance, is GitHub and the Dependabot the gold standard in the space? Uh, so there is no gold standard as such. Uh, every organization is taking a different approach 
they have their private databases and their public databases that they rely on uh, same with the jfrog uh, x-ray as well so right now uh, big big companies like google uh, and some of the foundations uh, cloud native uh, foundations are looking to build a standard around this standardize the way in which the developers can consume a package and standardize the way in which uh, uh, these uh, vulnerability databases are ma maintained. One of the popular one is SLSA standard or SALSA standard that is proposed, proposed by Google. Uh, take a look at it, uh, you will find a lot of resources, but it takes some time for the industry to adopt any change. And uh, the problem is really fresh, uh, uh, I would say, because uh, it's still, I would say in the last two years, industry has changed a lot of uh, focus towards this OSS uh, supply chain and uh, monitoring. So it takes some time to go to a standard and adopt it. Um, okay. I think that's the only question, but I see Tyler, uh, you have- Yeah, sorry about that. I'm notorious question okay. asker. Okay, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, Mark, do you have a question? Yeah, Hurtado. To, for those uh, of us who don't know, Mark and I work at the same organization. That's why I'm picking on him. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I I had a, a couple questions, Gotham. Like you mentioned, you know, shifting left and scanning at the developer workstation, and I I definitely see the benefit of it. Often, you know, when we do that, developers complain about you know performance on their workstation if it's constantly scanning. Um, from from your feedback working with other development teams, have you found though it's it's worth enforcing that, catching it early, or do you get inconsistent results and it's better to do it at the repository level or at a at a pull request type of event? I would say definitely uh, it is worth it enabling that feedback because at the end of the day. Uh, at some point or, or the other, you will start doing the enforcement. Every organization that is building the software will start to do this enforcement as I see it uh, 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 imminent, right? The Log4j is not like a one-time event that happened last year and uh, it will go silent uh, in the next few years. So as a good uh, harbinger towards the direction and uh, a good practice towards the direction, enabling the feedback wouldn't hurt. Uh, definitely, there are tools that impose lesser uh, burden on the developer's workstation and can offload it to a threat intelligence platform, uh, for example. So you should uh, definitely explore the tools and see what works best for them. For example, uh, to, to me, some of the developers like ID feedback tools. Some developers said that, hey, uh, having a good report sent to me every night uh, on the nightly build that will help me because I can just examine the report and see if there's any way in which I can implement at least 10% of the feedback that is available in the report, for example. Yeah, okay. And another question, Taylor kind of brought this up, but I, I know a lot of the services like GitHub and Bitbucket offer security scanning and there's Dependabot that's, you know, for free. Um, what but then they have their advanced security, um, which for a large organization can quite, can be quite a bit more expensive. From from your from your experience, um, are those advanced security scanning like maybe the JFrog offers at Art Factory and and uh, you know GitHub and Amazon and those that offer those are those? Do you get a lot bigger benefit from that? And if so, are there how do you convince management of the, you know, that it's worth paying for that service versus the free service? Yeah, I would definitely say it's a tricky question. Being a sales engineer, <laughs> uh, <laughs> working for a company that is producing the SCI tools. Uh, so what I see uh, as a common trend as well is that people are also looking at uh, remediation as a, uh, uh, important uh, uh, information uh, that they need as a part of the SCA, SCA alerts that they receive. So I see that a lot of times 
uh, uh, these premium capabilities, like uh, uh, you know, examining all the other upstream and downstream GitHub projects and uh, finding the best version of a given dependency that you need to move to. This is something that uh, usually it. <laughs> The export report is not solved. Thank you for joining us today at RSA 2022. We look forward to welcoming you back tomorrow morning in the export report. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, so usually there are some benefits with it. Uh, and uh, at some point or the other, you will see that the premiums that these providers give you might not be fitting your organization needs. For example, the first question that uh, the developer asks is, hey, I fixed it in this specific sub project, but that is breaking the entire build at an org level or at the framework level. So how do I make sure that this helps? And then you examine the GitHub page or JFrog page and see that, hey, okay, this involves me to pay some extra bucks uh, to get this capability. But again, but I would say that still the freemiums are a good entry point because it is better to have something than nothing it is yeah. better to be security aware than completely blindsided from it and then see what needs your developers have what initiatives or directions your organization is heading towards and see what tool set or what feature capabilities are matching your needs and only buy them and incrementally adopt them, right? That will be a good path uh, for your organization. That's good. I can I can maybe add to that from like the developer side. I think it's really common to have like each language, each ecosystem tends to have its own sort of SaaS tools. So like the static analysis tools that you can run as like essentially a linter at the IDE stage and also in your CI at the workflow stage. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm not as sophisticated as, as Gotham here, but like our combination, we typically use like a SaaS at that level. And then also like the um, OSS scanning in terms of like the dependent about alerts or like NPM has one that's really big. And that's sort of like the two primary components. And yeah. I don't know if we necessarily need for an organization our size at PDQ that we have like a need for those big premium services. But maybe if you're working at a big, big company, maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it varies from org to org and uh, uh, it can be very specific as well. Some startups just work with uh, federal customers and they, they want to certify it. Uh, so again, uh, uh, it, it, it really depends on your use case. Yeah. And usually there's a complementary solution to an SCA tool, uh, which is the SAS tool that uh, analyzes the custom code vulnerabilities, whatever the vulnerabilities that are present in your own code, uh, it, can, it can detect them and uh, uh, showcase them whatever the vulnerabilities coming in from the open source dependencies that you're using uh, is something that the SEA tool or software composition analysis tool can flag. And you need both, right? You need to make sure your, your proprietary code is safe, your uh, open source dependencies are safe, which will make your software safe. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there any other questions for the group? If not, we're, we're out of time, but Gotham, we sure appreciate you taking time out of your conference to speak to us tonight. And uh, I appreciate the, uh, did everyone get the link to, to enter that raffle for the Lego helmet? Um, you have a good chance of getting that. And then uh, just to ask again, we're, we're gonna do these every month. We're planning on a conference uh, a year from in 2023. I think we're shooting for May of 2023, but we're going to keep doing these each month. Um, if there's anyone, if you know someone that would like to present, we always like to get local presenters too. If there's a tool you're using or a process you're following, or you just want to kind of show, show something you're working on, uh, this is a great, great, great audience to present to. And we have a pretty large mailing list that we can, can uh, remind people to attend. So, uh, we just encourage you to, to be a presenter. Let us know. And thanks again for everyone 
coming today. And uh, thanks again, Jay Frog. And we'll see everyone next month. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.